Matthew chapter 1. While you're finding your place, I'm going to try to find my Bible. There it is. Matthew chapter 1. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. And there's a good commentary actually on the back of your church bulletin this week written about uh, some scientists and their uh, and their reasons that the theological truths affirmed by the solar eclipse this week. Uh, and so I, it's, it's a good article. And it's a, I believe it's a real help, good perspective on it. And it'll, be, it'll help you if you'll take time to look at that. So I want to mention that really put that in the bulletin. Or you, we got it from Baptist Press. Might be something important to share with someone this week. Folks, I'm pretty excited about this solar eclipse. I have heard from some people that they can't sleep at night. They're just so excited about it. They just are looking forward to the solar eclipse. I personally am going to remain indoors if, if I'm able to during it, just in case I uh, am tempted to look at it and get blinded or something. The way I, and you may read the article last week about the people that got blinded by the last one that happened. I'm thinking, I'm just going to stay inside. I'm going to take a chance on this solar eclipse. But, uh, you know, God did hang the stars in space. And it's amazing that He is such a reminder when we see something like a solar eclipse where people that were heathens and pagans used to be afraid that the sun was being darkened and that the world was over and that they were all going to die. And when we see it, we recognize that God has hung the stars in space and He's in control of the whole world and that we don't have to be afraid of anything because of the God that we have. Or if you found your place in Matthew chapter 1, I want to follow up and uh, begin as we're looking at preaching through Matthew and Matthew's Gospel and the Gospel uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ and who He was. I want to begin reading today in verse 11. If you were not here last week, I wish that you had been. Last week we saw the women that God used, the amazing way that God used people uh, in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to mention just a little bit of that in our introduction. But last week one of the things that we saw were the kind of people that God used. And we were reminded that God can use anyone. God can use absolutely anyone. We'll see a little bit more of that theme today but perhaps just a little bit better. We're going to see more about God and His character and some of the things uh, that uh, have to do with injustices in life. Verse, verse 11 of Matthew chapter 1. And Josias beget Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias beget Salathiel, and Salathiel beget Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel beget Abiad, and Abiad beget Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are fourteen generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are fourteen generations. That's no coincidence, is it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible, for your word, that we can not only confidently know is a book that's true, a book that we could ask any question as difficult as they may be, and we'll find answers for. But God, I pray that today that we would see not only the kind of people that you use but your nature and your character as we look at the Scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we, we did see Tamar. And I wish actually that everybody that is here this morning could have been in our Sunday school class. We're in our team class. We're uh, talking about issues. And uh, our theme for our team class is we got issues and the Bible has answers. One of the issues we were talking about in our teen class today is dealing with injustice. Life isn't fair. And things aren't equal. Things aren't just and equal. And it's really easy to look at some people's lives and just think, they've had it so good. And I've had it so opposite. 
of what they've had. And we looked this morning, we began that, that topic by looking at Joseph. I want to just tell you something, Joseph's family was messed up. One of the things that I appreciate about the Bible, the Word of God, is that God's Word is really honest about people. In other words, when, when uh, false religions write a holy book, they cover up or they hide things that are bad about, the, about their leaders. You won't find anything about Joseph Smith's history in the, in the uh, Mormon religion. You won't find out that he was literally run out of several towns because he was a con artist and a thief. Uh, you don't see the different wives that were married to other men that Joseph Smith married. You don't have a record of all the people he murdered in cold blood. I mean, murdered. He was a murderer. He was a thief. Uh, a town in Missouri, I don't know about this, is not about Mormonism, Dave. I'm just giving you for instance. There's a town in Missouri that Joseph Smith went to, and he conned the people so badly. He was such a slick con artist that he actually told the people that God had told him that there was going to be a new government, a new currency, and he started a Mormon currency. He got all the people to bring their worthless United States currency and trade him for Mormon currency and left town. It's a stunt Joseph Smith pulled. If you go to the Church of Mormon, uh, or you go to the Church of Jesus Christ, quote of the Latter-day Saints, you'll never hear that, but that's fact of history. That actually happened. But you know, the Bible actually is very different than that. God uses people who are very imperfect, and God records their imperfections. I mean, He just tells you straight up. Now, we were talking about Israel today and how messed up His family was. We were telling, I was talking with our teenagers, you know, it was, I mean, it was just the way it had been in His family. Uh, Abraham had taken his wife's handmaid and had a son with him because God had promised that he was going to have a son. He didn't see how God could work it, and so he worked it out in his own flesh. Had a son with his wife's servant. And so then his wife hated his servant, naturally. And then when she had a legitimate son, there was a, those two boys basically became enemies, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had two sons, and he loved his son Esau, and his wife loved his son Jacob, and they didn't care for their other sons, and so their sons hated each other, and mom and dad hated their sons. That was messed up. Yeah. Jacob wanted to marry a girl named Rachel. He was in love with her, but his, his uncle, his mom, who he was the favorite son of, his uncle tricked him, his mom's brother, tricked him into marrying his other daughter, Leah. And he had kids with her, and, she, and so <clears throat> then he finally worked seven more years and married Rachel. Now he's got two wives. The Bible forbids that, by the way. I heard this last week, some nonsense about, well, at Bible times, they were allowed to have multiple marriages. No, it was forbidden in the Scripture. Amen. Marriage is defined as one man, one woman. When God gave His law to Israel, uh, He expressly forbade kings being like the pagan kings and having a multiplicity of wives. The Bible said it was wrong. And yet Israel did. He had two wives. He had Leah, and then he had Rachel. And Leah had a lot of kids, and Rachel didn't. Rachel felt terrible. Leah, Leah wasn't loved by her husband, so she kind of held it against her, her sister, Rachel, that she couldn't have children. And so Rachel gave her handmaid to Jacob to have children with. And, of course, she hated her handmaid after she could have kids. And then so Leah did the same thing with her handmaid. Now, Jacob has children with four women, and they're all part of the same household. That's messed up. And then Leah or Rachel finally has kids, and because Jacob loves her more than he loves Leah, he loves her son Joseph. He was his son of his old age, and he loved him more than all his brethren. And because Joseph's brethren uh, were loved less than Joseph, they hated him. And so, naturally, most kids would resent their father for loving them more than their brethren and making their brothers hate him. Joseph's brothers tried to kill him. But Reuben stopped him from killing him, so instead they sold him as a slave into Egypt. I'm just telling you, he's messed up. And one of the things I appreciate about the Bible is that God does not gloss over or does not cover up things that are just wicked. And yet, God uses wicked people. And God changes people that are sinners. Last week as we were going through the genealogies, we were introduced to Tamar. And it happened actually at the same time of that story of Joseph. If you were to read Genesis chapter 38, uh, as we referred to it last week, you would see that this guy Judah, one of 
one of Jacob's messed up sons. His son married a wife, and his son was wicked, and God, God killed him. And so because of the importance of the, her of the heritage, the inheritance, and God's blessing, she wanted to be married to his second son. He promised her, hey, you're going to... You're, and his second son said, well, I don't want my son to be representative of my brother and have uh, really be considered to be my brother's son, so he refused to have children with her, and God killed him. And Judah said, she's a black widow, man. Both of my sons have died. And so he refused to give her his third son, and so she committed an immoral act. She acted like she was a, a, a harlot. She committed an immoral act with her father-in-law and had a son with him. And that son is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Tamar. God used a woman. God used a woman who was far from perfect in a family that was messed up to be in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. After they'd been in Egypt and God delivered them out before they went into the promised land, two of the spies went into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. They met a woman there and she was a harlot. And she believed God. She had faith in God. She actually joined God's sight. She's the one that put the linen, the red linen out of her window so that they would, so that God wouldn't destroy her household. She, she showed faith in God. And she's in the, she married an Israelite. She's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. King David was a man after God's own heart. He messed up. And he committed murder. He committed adultery with a man's wife and then killed the man to cover it up. And their baby died, but then God had a son born, Solomon. And that woman that he committed adultery with, Bathsheba, she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And so the genealogies tell us a lot, don't they? Folks, I just want to tell you something today. You know, sometimes we can be pretty proud of our heritage, can't we? I mean, you know, you have folks that have accomplished some things or done things, and you're proud of them. But I'll tell you something. When you start digging, there's skeletons in everybody's family. I mean, there's some, just some pretty messed up stuff. But God is an amazing God, and He can deliver you. And God can use you. And it might be if someone were to go back in your life and they were to look at your past, they could dig up some things that God's forgiven. But God's going to use you. So God's going to do some things with you. And I just want us to see God's character, and I want to see it one more time. And uh, when I talk about people, man, God, God's Word records the good, the bad, and the ugly just about, about, just about everyone. You read about the apostles? Let's, let's, let's think about some of them. Peter. God used Peter to pen Scripture, but we know some things about Peter, don't we? He's the one that had enough faith to get out of the boat, but lost faith and began to sink. He's the one that would say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus would say, Blessed art thou, son, John, Simon, son of Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but God. And then Peter's the same guy that denied Jesus. Two times. I don't know him, and he cursed and swore. Same guy. He's a guy that always got it wrong, and yet God used him. Peter, even after that, even after he'd been restored to Christ, he's one of the apostles, and God's doing great things with him. Do you remember? He was the one that God told first that the Gentiles were supposed to be part of God's plan and to be saved. And then you remember when the believers got together and Peter disseminated himself, he separated himself. He, he hung out with the Jews, but he, he, he stayed away from the Gentiles like they weren't as good. And God used Paul to rebuke him. You know, a lot of people think, man, Paul was like the super Christian in the New Testament. Yeah, you know, not many super Christians have actually been responsible for murdering Christians. When you think about it. When Paul said, I, you know, I'm the chief of sinners, he was a murderer. He'd actually killed Christians. Been responsible for the death of believers. Had wreaked havoc against the church of God and God saved him changed his life. He was a pretty good guy after he was saved, but he was a murderer before that. Pretty lousy fellow. I was pretty honest about it. There are a couple of people in the Bible that I look at the Scripture's account of them, though, and there's just nothing bad that's said about them. On Saturday nights, I've been preaching with our teen group about Daniel. I've been looking at Daniel. One of the things I love about Daniel is that, man, he was a youth, he purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. And you just see Daniel last, outlast and live through different kings and kingdoms and 
he just there's just never anything where he dishonored God. I mean, Daniel just always did the right thing. That's rare, though. It's pretty rare to find someone like that. And uh, there's another guy. There's another couple of guys I think of. One of them is in our text today. It's Joseph, the, the husband of Mary. And uh, in verse 16, the Bible says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. And then we saw that, you know, from Abraham until the carrying of, or until uh, <coughs> David was 14 generations, from King David until the captivity in Babylon was 14 generations, and from Babylon until Christ was born was 14 generations. Now, that's more than just interesting. God doesn't do things accidentally. I'm not going to take the 14 generations and try to figure out whether or not Christ is going to return soon, but some people try to do that, you know. They count the number of years, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, and they figure, hey, Jesus for Christ is probably about to come right now because God does something big about every 2,000 years or so. Uh, actually, actually that's, that's the wrong numbers. It would have been before that, be 1,500 years. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Anyway, uh, I, the Bible says that no man knows the time. And so that isn't what's being taught by the 14 generations here. If you've ever heard that taught, you can't know something God says that the Son of Man doesn't even know. If Jesus doesn't know it, you don't either. I don't mean to be unkind to you, but uh, you don't know more than God does, God's Son does. So the point of all that being is that it's not coincidental what God did. is very, very systematic, very orderly. And I think we'll know more about that when we're in heaven. But look at verse 18. We're going to talk about the birth of Christ. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't need to be graphic and I don't intend to be at all, but that's impossible. It's impossible for a woman to have a child uh, without being with a man. And so this was something that was supernatural. But Joseph didn't know that. The Bible says in verse uh, 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So the law said that Joseph was supposed to bring her before the town, expose her as, uh, being, uh, as being not a virtuous woman, and she was supposed to be put to death. Joseph, the Bible says, was a just man, and he didn't want to do that. And so his thought was, I'm just going to put her away privately. I'm just going to not tell anyone. I'm just going to be single. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna marry her, but it brought shame to his household, thinking that Mary was with child. Now we know that what happened with Mary was that the, what was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. You study the Bible and you understand why the virgin birth is so important. It's because by the seed of man, the sin nature is passed on. And what was miraculous about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ was that there's no seed of man involved in Jesus. And so he didn't have, that's the way that Jesus was born, the way God's Spirit did it without sin. Is God able to, to cause a woman to conceive without a man? Well, God could create a woman if he wanted to, and he can create anything he wants to, and certainly God is able by the Holy Ghost to conceive a child that is God in a woman, and that's what God did, the miraculous virgin birth. And you should study that. You'd understand that that promise, there was the woman's seed that was going to bruise the serpent's Heal. That's in Genesis 3, 15 and 16. That's the prophecy that at the moment the first man sinned, God gave the promise of the virgin birth. Genesis 3, 15. And so this is what God told Joseph. Now I want to look at we're gonna we're gonna look at that the virgin birth and so forth some doctrines in the next several weeks that I think all of us need to learn about. Some of us may know some things vaguely, but actually we need to educate ourselves on this because it's part of the gospel. And it's there are a lot of things that believers just actually just don't know what the Bible teaches about. So we're going to look at some of those things closely as we preach through Matthew. But I want to focus on this guy Joseph. And Joseph would be another one of those guys that you look at in the Bible and you recognize this is just a guy that, that, there doesn't, that the Bible doesn't say anything bad about at all. He was just a good man. I may not get to him, but I'll mention it. We will try to look at Jonathan, Saul's son. And uh, Joseph, I believe, and Jonathan had some things in common. That is that they were good men that came from bad people. Let's go, if you will with me, please, back to Jeremiah in your Bible. That'll be back in the Old Testament. Uh, not, not too far, actually. So you would have uh, Psalm, Proverbs, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, I, I, it's before that. Uh, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. 
and then Isaiah and Jeremiah. So if you go back and you find Proverbs, which is right in the middle of your Bible or right after Psalms, then you'll find Jeremiah right after that. And I would like for you, if you will, please, to go to chapter 22 of Jeremiah. Now I want us to notice something. We read in our text today in Matthew chapter 1, uh, in verse 11, Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren. I'd like to go back and look at this fellow, Jeconiah. So we're in Je Jeremiah chapter 22. Did I say chapter 20? No, I, said I said 22. Okay, so I only thought I said the wrong thing. There you go. <laughs> Okay, in verse 28, the Bible says, well, let's look at verse 24. As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah the son of Jeconiah, Jehoiakim, then Coniah would be Jeconiah, uh, though Coniah the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bear thee into another country, where you are not born, and there shall ye die. But to the land whereunto they desire to turn, thither shall they not return. Verse 28. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O oh, earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. Now, when the Bible says, hear the word of the Lord, notice verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David, ruling any more in Judah. Will you please go with me back to Ephesians, I'm not Ephesians, to Matthew chapter 1 and look with me again at verse 11. The Bible says, And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now this Jeconias, the Jeconiah, that is identified, and you can just trace the hand, lineage and realize that they had different spellings for his name from the Hebrew and from the Greek. His name would have been spelled differently in the Greek as it is in the Hebrew, much like your name would be different in Spanish or in French or whatever. In other words, John would be Juan, George would be Jorge, and so forth. Well, that would be what? <coughs> what about Creole? I don't think they allow Georges in Creole. <laughs> now, I don't know. Maybe Fabulon does. What would George be in Creole? Do they have a George in Creole? George. George, that's it. They don't. They don't like Georges be different. Creole. There's your answer, Uncle Father. Nice. Okay. All right. Good question. <laughs> so my point being that this guy Coniah is Jeconiah, Jeconiah, or Coniah. Why did God have to say to Jeconiah the things He did? Well, you'd have to read Jeremiah actually and see. If you read Jeremiah, you will see that the children of Israel were worshiping idols, and they had, as a nation, agreed, hadn't they? that they would keep God's law. What's the first of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They were worshiping idols. God gave them Jeremiah the prophet to prophesy what God was doing and what their future was. And Jeconiah would just hire false prophets to contradict what, the, what God's prophet Jeremiah had said. This guy Jeconiah was as wicked as he could be. He literally would destroy God's word he would not listen to God. And God said to Jeconiah, uh, he'd raise up prophets. So God said uh, to Jeconiah and to Judah, you're going to go into captivity in Babylon. The Chaldeans are coming. And I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar was becoming very powerful and he was conquering nations. And so Jeconiah had the plan, we're just going to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and we're going to form an allegiance with him and we're going to be strong enough that that uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to be able to conquer us. Well, guess what? <laughs> Egypt got conquered. And God said to Jeconiah, you're going into Babylon. God had given His word to them. He said, you can go to Babylon two ways. Because you deserve the captivity, you can just go peacefully and you can live there and I'll take care of you and I'll bring you out again. Or you can... You can rebel against me and you can try to fight Nebuchadnezzar 
and you'll still go to Babylon, except you'll have what happens to you when you fight somebody more powerful than you. You'll be destroyed. Jeconiah was so haughty and so against God, he thought he could just raise up a prophet to say what he wanted to say and just believe his own truth. And by the way, there are people that purport or claim to be Christians that think that they can just come up with their own reality. I know Christians that you, you try to tell them God's truth and they rebuke it. You ever met somebody? I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Well, Jesus doesn't rebuke it. God's Word says it. Sorry, bud. Your rebuking doesn't mean it's so or not. God's God. And what God says is, will be. And if you'll bow to it, God can bless you. But you can't come up with your own reality. There are a lot of people that think that they can make their own reality. Lost people and saved people alike. You know, this whole, you know, you can be anything you want to be, it's just about done with, isn't it? I've made fun of for years, not it's just because just I'm a mean guy, I guess, but I've made fun of for years the participation awards. You know, you go to, everybody plays and nobody wins. And everybody gets a trophy because everybody's a winner. You know, <laughs> let me tell you a funny story. I haven't had anything to do with anything necessarily, but maybe you'll wake back up if you're not paying attention right now. Uh, in our church in Delray Beach, we used to have saints, you know, the homeschool group that would come through and they would do sports with the kids. And Coach Rick was a very nice guy. It espouses to the philosophy of, you know, you don't want anybody to win, nobody to lose. You don't want somebody to feel like they're better, and somebody to feel like they're not as good, and so forth. So every time anybody do anything, you know, they'd say they're a, you're a winner. I remember my pastor's son working for them, and he was there catching footballs. And there was this one poor boy that uh, was probably pretty similar to the way I tried to catch a football when I was his age. I mean, literally, he'd trip on his own feet, and, you know, he'd catch the ball and bang it into his own face, you know. And I remember he, he went out for a pass, and... Uh, Sean, pastor's son, throwing him the ball like this, and, and he throws the ball, and the kid, like, the ball just like bang, 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 you know, and he trips and falls down the, on the ground, and Sean's like, you're a winner! <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, the reality of it is is that, you know, we're what God made us to be, and, if, and God can make us, by His grace, to be able to do things that are beyond what we could do. But if we want to believe in ourselves, we're believing in it not much. You know, I hate to say it, but you never may never be a rocket surgeon. I know, I know. Everybody wants to be a rocket surgeon. You never be. You may never be a brain scientist. Uh, it just may never happen for you. Uh, you may. You, maybe you're not smart enough. Maybe God didn't give you enough of a brain for it. And you know something? You can pick your own reality and have the consequences for it. I'm not being mean or unkind this morning, but you're who God made you to be, and that's perfect. And until you learn to say what God made me and what my life is, is what God wants, you're always going to be frustrated and bitter. You're going to, you're going to deal with depression. You're going, to, uh, you're going to have thoughts of hatred, murder, and suicide. Because you haven't found your worth in what God made you to be. And so, believer, it's important for us to recognize these things. And I just want to tell you something. This guy, Jack and I, was a rebel. And God said, this is what's going to happen. He said, I'm going to give me a prophet to tell me you said something different than that. And guess what happened? He went into the captivity of Babylon. And God said, because of your attitude, Jeconiah, your children will not sit on the throne of David. In other words, he was in the lineage of David, and he was a king. And so it could have been that he would have been the one who would have had Christ, the Messiah, be part of his lineage. But because of his rebellion, God said, God said, if you were the signet on my hand, in other words, that's a really important thing, if you were the signet on my finger, you wouldn't go or you, wouldn't be, you would not sit on the throne of the, of the king of David. I rejected you from being king, and none of your sons will be kings. Now let me ask you a practical question. How fair is that for, for Jack and I's lineage? Really? How fair is that? I mean, what in the world did Joseph, the husband of Mary, do to be cursed from sitting on the throne of David? You know, there's another guy in the Bible that this kind of parallels. Probably, I don't know if I have favorites, but probably one of my favorite guys. I believe the most manly man in the Bible is, is uh, uh, Saul's son, Jonathan. And there are some manly men in the Bible. David, for instance. David, I mean, David just believed God so much that as a youth, he said, who's this guy, Goliath, the giant, that he's going to defy the armies of the living God? And David killed Goliath, and he was a youth. Goliath was a giant, more than nine foot tall. You want to look at our basketball rim? Uh, Goliath's head would have been in the net. His hands could reach to the top of the, of the backboard. 
You know, this room in here, uh, this is just under 10 foot tall. The last head would be like up in here. I'm standing on, I think, 8 inches of platform. And so if I were to stand on this, I'm about maybe close to Goliath's height. Can you imagine him being proportionate? <laughs> they, they, they measured the, the weight of his beam and his spear. I'll just tell you, size does matter in some things, sure. especially fighting. we got some, several guys in here. You guys are martial artists. And you know that, hey, man, you can be quick, you can be tough, but they're just some people, you know, they've got a major advantage over you. You're going to have to get lucky with them because size matters. This is how big Goliath was. I mean, literally a couple of me, like his head, I'd be looking up to him right here, this high. Okay, that's, that's, that's big, right? David killed him. <laughs> David was quite a man. But David had a friend, Jonathan, that if you look at in the Bible, Jonathan was more of a man, I think, than David was. He was. Uh, go to your Bible. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and come down. I'm done being Goliath. You guys don't mind. By the way, I mean, can you imagine if Goliath was proportionate? You know? Like, if he was this tall, how wide would he be? I, mean, you know, I don't know. I probably could reach. My friend and I, uh, when, we, when I was in college, worked in a mechanic shop. And there was a guy there that was a, uh, that was a bodybuilder. Not a bodybuilder. He was a power lifter. And he had 18-inch forearms. 18-inch forearms. He was pretty strong. He could bench at the time. He was benching, I think, 575. And I think he got over 600, which is like up there. with You know, it used to be 500 was the limit for people. He's a big, strong dude. My friend and I could stand shoulder to shoulder, and we were the same width as the guy. And he was only like an inch taller than me, but he was just like... This massive guy. He'd always say, hey, Ryan, come over here. you got those little skinny forearms. You can get in places. I hate him calling my forearms a little skinny. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, you know, go over here. You can reach me. I can't reach this. Because he had these, he had 18-inch forearms. I mean, he was just a massive guy. Goliath was, like, way bigger than him. And, like, this tall. I mean, just made, would make Ken look just like a little fellow. Anyway, uh, that's another unrelated story. Let's look at uh, first... Samuel. Oops, I lost my place. I think it's, I want to look at chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. Oh, there it is. Okay. Actually, before that, let's look at uh, chapter 13. Remember Saul, King, King Saul? First king in Israel? God said, I don't want you to have kings, and I don't want your kings when you have them because you're going to disobey me. I don't want them to have multiple wives. Remember when Saul... The Bible says that he was head and shoulders taller than anyone else in uh, Israel. Like head and shoulders. So if Saul were standing in a crowd and you're trying to figure out where he was at, everybody else would be here. And Saul was like up here. He's a big guy. He's probably, I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing if the tall people in Israel, I don't know this. There's people that say they're all, you know, they're all Brother Tony's height, which is like nearly six foot, right, Brother Tony? Right, if, I mean, you're six foot if Brother Taj is, that's for sure. So, anyway, so, I, you know, if you're saying everybody else is Brother Tony's height, you might work for this. Come up here, brother. Let's help. Let's work this one just a little bit. Yeah, okay. So, so we got a, we got a land of, of uh, Italians. I mean, of Tony's, right? Yeah. This is just about perfect, actually, isn't it? Okay, so we got a crowd. We got a whole room. Of Tonys, right? You guys can imagine this. Can you envision like a hundred of them? We got to get the other Tony here too. This would be really perfect. Okay, and then you got Saul. Yeah, Saul's. I mean, Saul's a big guy. He's the biggest man in Israel, tallest guy in Israel. Now, compared to Goliath, Saul was pretty small. Where'd he go? <laughs> okay, brother Tony, thank you. All right, thank, thanks for the help. Okay, just just to visualize things. Saul was the Bible says little in his own sight. In other words, he. He was a big, tall guy, but he, he didn't, you know, he didn't make himself tall, and he wasn't like, hey, I'm taller than everybody. You know, he was, in his own sight, he was a small man. In other words, he didn't, he didn't bully anybody, he didn't push anybody, he didn't think, you know, he was anything special. But actually, you read about King Saul, he was quite a guy. God told Samuel that Saul was going to be king of Israel. Samuel, coincidentally, happened, Saul, I mean, it happened coincidentally, to be out looking for some donkeys that had gotten lost from his dad. And he ended up going to this guy's house, and, and the guy said, your donkeys have been found. But then Saul ended up getting, God used all the circumstances to bring Saul to the right place to be anointed king of Israel. And they were going to anoint him king of Israel, and he went and hid in some baskets. He didn't want to be king of Israel. 
And he, he had a lot of humility. He got anointed to be king of Israel and he went home. I mean, as we did, okay, I'm king. See you guys. He just went home, went back to work for his dad. Didn't do anything. Didn't say, hey, where's my benefits for being king? You know, he just king, he went home. And then there were some people that were doing some terrible things to the Israelites. And Saul took his dad's oxen and he cut them up into 12 pieces and he sent them to all the different tribes of Israel. There was no king in Israel, and so you could attack one person and no one else would do anything. No one would stand up. They said, I don't, you know, it's not my business. I don't want to get killed. And nobody would stand for anything, and so you could attack any individual. And as long as you had, were a bigger crowd than that individual, you could do whatever you wanted with them. That's the way all of Israel was. So Saul did this. He cut up his dad's ox and he sent them to each of the 12 tribes. And he said, if you don't come out and fight, I'm going to come cut you up. Same as these oxen. And everybody showed up. Because they were afraid of Saul. <laughs> and God used Saul to get to deliver him from the Philistines. I mean, literally in Israel, the battles against the Philistines, God used Saul. But then Saul kind of became a big shot. He started being really successful and he, he got away from God. And that's where we find him in 1 Samuel, and I believe it's uh, chapter 13. Uh, this is when verse... Uh, well, I don't want to read this part. In... Uh, Verse 11, this is after Saul has set up uh, and offered a sacrifice. You need to read 1 Samuel if you're not familiar with the Scripture. Unfortunately, we don't have time this morning. But I want to look down at uh, verse 12. This is Saul's answer about, about not fighting the battle God's way and not doing what God said. Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolish... No, verse 12, sorry. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Only a priest was supposed to offer the burnt offering, but Saul did. Of course, here's a guy who goes from being afraid to even be king, from not wanting to be recognized by anybody, to realize, saying, I can do anything I want to, and offering an offering that only the Levites were supposed to offer, only the high priest was supposed to offer. And he said, if a burnt offering needs to be offered, and Samuel hasn't shown up, I'll offer the burnt offering. He's gone from humility to arrogance. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which He commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord, which the Lord commanded thee. What a tragedy. What a travesty. The biggest, best-looking, strongest, most qualified, talented guy in Israel had become king. He had had humility before he became king. He was little in his own sight. Now he became big stuff in his own mind. And he just thinks he can even offer sacrifices in the place of the high priest. He can enter into places that, that God only allows certain people to enter. And he doesn't care what God himself thinks. And God said, because of that, I've rejected you from being king in Israel. What a tragedy. You know what Saul did? <laughs> he just kept on. He said, well, you know, if I, if, if I want to be king, I'll be king. Look at chapter 20. First scene of chapter 20. I'm almost done, by the way. Um, this is when Saul's trying to kill David because... God has had Samuel anoint David to be king of Israel, and David knows it. And everybody knows David's going to be the future king in Israel, except for Saul thinks that if he can kill David, then God won't be able to do what God's going to do. Let me just tell you something. You can't kill someone God doesn't want you to. You can't stop God from doing what God does, but Saul thought he could. It's amazing, isn't it, the level of arrogance that we can come to when we rebel against God. It's amazing what we think we can make work. Let me just... Uh, interject something here. You'll never be the first person to rebel against God and succeed. Yeah. Listen, you, you got, you're struggling with rebellion in your heart. You're rebellious. You don't like authority. You're angry with God. You're angry at what God has allowed in your life. My friend, you have two choices. You can realize that God doesn't allow evil and that God's going to take the evil circumstances in your life and He's going to judge the evil 
Or you can just get angry and bitter against God and rebel against Him. And I'll just tell you something, you won't be the first person to do the wrong thing and have good, good consequences. I don't know how many people I've met, Christians included, who think they can do the wrong thing and somehow it'll be different than it's been for every other person who's ever lived. When you sin against God, you'll be judged. You'll, it won't work. Evil does not have good consequences. And you'd far rather be the kind of person that says, you know what? If that's what God said, then that's what I believe and that's good enough for me. I want you to notice a contrast now. In verse 24 of 1 Samuel 20, Saul has a son, Jonathan, who has become David's best friend. They've conspired, David and Jonathan. David, Jonathan has recognized someday you're going to be king. God's, made, God's ordained for you to be king. And if you think about it, if anyone in the world ought to be bitter about it, it ought to be Jonathan, Saul's son. <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. If you're Saul's son, Jonathan... And you recognize you haven't done anything wrong, but God's rejected you from being king. And here's this little upstart, who isn't as tall as your dad or you probably, that's going to be king just because God's rejected you. Can you imagine what kind of an attitude Jonathan could have had? And yet he became best friends with David. And I, I love reading about Jonathan. By the way, if you want to do a character study in the Bible, study Jonathan sometime. I mean, this guy Jonathan... Let me just tell you a story about it. I know, I know we need to be done within five minutes, but we won't be, so don't worry about it. Uh, Jonathan and Saul were a couple of the only people in Israel that were allowed to have swords. The Philistines had taken all the swords from them, but Jonathan, because he was king and had one, Jonathan had an armor bearer that carried his sword. And here's what he said one time. He said, let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines, me and you, and let's take them on. Now, garrison would have been 100. Let's go take on 100 Philistines. And he said, God, now let's, have, let's do it this way. We'll, we'll, we'll ask God for a sign. If they say, come up here, then uh, you know we'll go up. And if they say, remain there, then we'll remain here, whatever they do. And they got themselves in this little blocked up passageway where nobody could get them on either side. And Jonathan whooped 100 Philistines by himself, one-on-one. -on -one. They just kept coming. He just kept killing them. I'd quit coming if I were Philistines. I mean, he's a bad dude. Him and his armor bearer, he said, watch my back. I'm going to fight these guys. I just look at Jonathan. Uh, another time, Jonathan didn't know that his dad had made a commandment that nobody was supposed to eat until, until the battle was over or until, I can't remember what the, the specifics were, the day breaks or whatever. Jonathan went out and literally killed hundreds of people by himself, fighting the Philistines who were trying to oppress the children of Israel. Killed them by himself, and then he... He uh, put his sword in a in a horn at a bee's nest and took honey because he was hungry. And then Saul commanded that his son was going to be killed. And Jonathan didn't have anything to say to his dad about it. When Jonathan first met David after David had killed Goliath, and his dad had brought uh, David kind of into the palace to to uh, serve there and to work, Jonathan took off his sash, which would have been a kingly sash, and he put it on David. And he took off his sword and his bow and his arrows, and he put them on David, and he gave him his bow and his sword and his arrows. And they were the king's son's weapons. He gave them to David. And Jonathan knew that he wasn't ever going to be king in Israel. He actually knew, I'm never going to be king in Israel. And I don't know about you, but being the king's son, laying awake at night and thinking, I'm never going to be king in Israel, you might be a little bitter about that. Because Jonathan had never done anything wrong. You can't find a place in the Bible where the Scripture says that Jonathan ever did anything wrong. He was a valiant man. He was a courageous man. And I'll be honest with you. If I'm going to pick a guy for king, Jonathan's my guy. He's bold. He's courageous. He's compassionate. He loves God. There's not a better guy. If I'm going to pick a guy for a son-in-law, Jonathan's my guy. I mean, he's just there's just not a better man then Jonathan, he's just an excellent guy, and yet because his daddy sinned, he doesn't get to be king in Israel. That messed some of you up. Some of you would say, that's not fair. I didn't do anything. It was my father that did that. I had nothing to do with that. And I just want you guys to notice Jonathan. I want you to look at something here. Uh, chapter 20 and verse 30. Then Saul's anger was... Oh, uh, sorry, let's look at verse 29. 
And he said, this is Jonathan explaining why David didn't come so Saul could kill him. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brother. And therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman. Now who was the perverse, rebellious person? Yeah, his wife. It wasn't his wife. It was Saul. Now why is it that, that Jonathan conspired to keep David from being killed by his father? Because it was unjust of his father to kill an innocent man. David was innocent. He'd served Saul faithfully. He wasn't trying to supplant him. And Jonathan was a fair guy. And he said, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and in the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Wherefore Jonathan knew it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month for his grief for David because his father had done him shame. You just look at this guy Jonathan. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a Jonathan? He's loyal to his father, but he can't kill an innocent man. His dad's wrong. And God has rejected Saul from being king in Israel, and Saul knows it. <clears throat> so Saul thinks that by killing the person that God has chosen to be king, that Jonathan somehow is going to get to be king. And he said, you son of a rebellious woman. He said, you have, you're trying to help this guy be king, and it's to your own confusion. It's going to keep you from being able to be king because of what you've done. And Jonathan just simply asked his dad, why are you trying to kill an innocent guy? You know what Saul did? He took his javelin and he tried to kill his own son. You know what Jonathan did? He got mad. <laughs> That's it. Got angry and he went out. And he realized, okay, my dad's going to try to kill an innocent man. He didn't believe it. He said, I don't think, I think he's just mad at you, David. I just think, I don't think he'd really kill you now he knows. But he tried to kill me because I wouldn't let him slay you. And now he knows. I'm going to just tell you something, folks. Poor Jonathan. I tell you something, when I read about Jonathan, and I read even about his sons, and I read about the way that Jonathan died, I've, I've cried tears many times reading through 1 Samuel just thinking about poor Jonathan. Then it's occurred to me, he's probably okay. You know where that guy's at right now? He's with God. He didn't get to be part of the lineage of King David. but he got to be adopted in to the tribe of Judah through Jesus. He was son of Benjamin anyway. The prophecy was for Judah's line. Friend, Jonathan's okay. He's alright. I read the genealogies and I read about Joseph and I think, you know, Joseph had nothing to do with Jeconiah. He was such a just man that when his wife was with child and he thought the worst because it was all he could think. He thought that she'd been unfaithful to him. He just wanted to privately make the matter go away and not embarrass her. He wasn't even bitter for himself. I can imagine a little bit Joseph being a God, good godly man that he must have known the Scripture. Don't you think he might have? I think he probably knew about that about Jeconiah being of the lineage of Christ. Do you think if you were in the lineage of the king in Israel that you'd know your lineage? Sure. There are a lot of people <laughs> that have trumped up heritage. I've met people that say, I'm a princess. I'm related to such and such and such and such and such and such. And I think, no, that would be the firstborn. You're not part of the firstborn. You're not a princess. You're not a prince. Or whatever it is. You know, Joseph was. I mean, he was a descendant of the king of Israel and he was the firstborn. He's in the lineage of David and he's the rightful king of Israel and yet he's rejected from being king because Jeconiah was such a punk. 
his great, 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 great grandfather way back. 14 generations. 14 generations back. Now listen, we're going to tie up the loose ends and draw a conclusion this morning. Ask yourself the question, is it right for God to reject you because of what someone did 14 generations back? I'm not asking you to take the, the right position. I'm asking you to just think from your perspective. You'll never get to be king because of what Jack and I did. You had nothing to do with that. And who are you going to blame for it? Who's the one that said that a guy like Joseph could be in the lineage of Christ? Who said that? I'll tell you who did. God said that. God said that. Listen to me carefully now, Christian. Please do. This is so important. This will help you with so many things in your life. So many things. Not a single one of us here chose our birthday, did we? I didn't choose when to be born. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose the circumstances that my parents raised me under. And neither did you. The fact of the matter is that because of original sin, there's evil in the world and there has been since the first man sinned. And a lot of what has happened to you in your life has been pure evil. And you know it. And God knows it. And so your response is, why did this happen to me? Or why did God allow this to happen to me? And you have taken something that you think is a logical flow of thought and you've drawn an illogical conclusion. And you say, God's not good. God's not good. I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest with you. This is the way we think, isn't it? Why is it that this person is born? Why couldn't I have been David? Why did I have to be Jonathan? Couldn't God have made me anybody? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's only one David. And he's him. And you may look around, you may spend your lifetime just looking around you and looking at what's messed up in your life and what you had nothing to do with and you may respond accordingly. And you say, God, I hate you. I've met people who say, I hate God. I've had people just say vile, profane things about God because of the life that they were born in. And they have forgotten that your life circumstances have nothing to do with what God can do with you. Did you hear me now? Your life circumstances, the things you can do nothing about, have nothing to do with what God can do with you. And I'll tell you one of the reasons I'm, I'm just such a fan, personally, of Jonathan. His dad was a full-on rebel. His dad messed up his own life and his dad messed up Jonathan's life. And Jonathan said, I like that guy David. He's a good fellow. He's going to be king of Israel. You know what he said one time to David? He said, you're going to be king and I'm going to be your best servant. I'll be your right hand man, David. I'd love to serve with you. You say, well, David must have been a great guy. I'd say second to, to the guy that <laughs> said, I'll be your servant. What kind of a guy is the king's son and says, you know, God's going to make you the king. And when he does, man, I'm going to be there for you. Jonathan. Jonathan. And I'm telling you, I've wept when I've read about the story of Saul's sons dying. And the tragedy of it was the testimony of Israel. The same guy that God had raised up and he'd, he'd caused people to be courageous. And I read David's, David's um, uh, what do they call the the eulogy that that he reads over Saul and his sons and talks about what beautiful strong men they were, how beautiful Jonathan was in his death. David wept over the death of his friend Jonathan. I just think, oh, it's so tragic. It's so sad that Jonathan died. Let me let you in on some things that I've also thought. One, if Jonathan had lived to be king of Israel, he'd be dead today. If he'd gotten to be king of Israel and reigned for 40 years or 60 years or maybe 80 years, he wouldn't have probably, but say 40 or 60 years. If he'd gotten to be king of Israel for 60 years, he'd still be dead today. 
You know, a lot of times people are so upset about their lot in life, and the reason they're upset about their lot in life, hear me now, is because they think that this short life is an end of itself. And my friend, this life is lived for eternity. And guess what? When it comes to eternity, Jonathan's doing pretty well. Did you hear me? Hey, listen, his life wasn't fair, but I'm telling you something. In God's economy, <laughs> I guarantee you, Jonathan's got an important part. When, when, when Jesus Christ sets up his future kingdom, you think Jonathan's going to be a nobody? You think so? The Bible says we're going to reign in proportion to how we serve the Lord Jesus. And Jonathan served God his whole life, and he loved David, and he was just a courageous, valiant man, and he died a tragic death, and God knows it, and God will take care of him. God's taking care of him. Hey, listen, you, you may go through life, and you may just have some things, and you just say, this is just hard, this is more than I can bear. My friend, you can bear it. I've said many times some things that are joking, but there, there's a philosophy behind it. Many times I've said, you know, I've just got to make it to the grave and I'll be set. It's all i got to do. Man, when something breaks on my body, and I'm in a lot of pain, I think, well, this body's only got to last until I die. So, hey, small wonder to wear out first. You know, i just got to make it to the grave and I'll be set. I don't need to be poor and I don't need to be wealthy. I don't need to have people follow me or people be impressed by me. I don't need to have a life of ease. I just need to live for Jesus. And God's going to take care of me. I'm just fine. But so let me tell you something. You, you've been in relationships and you've been hurt, you've been wounded, and it may be that you have to deal with loneliness. I'll tell you, loneliness is the, the biggest <laughs> Area is the greatest stumbling block in any person. Loneliness is one of the things that people literally they just can't they can't handle they can't they can't manage, and they do the wrong thing they make wrong choices because of loneliness. So I'm going to tell you something. God knows about your loneliness. You're not going to be lonely forever. I can't handle it. Yeah, you can. You can, by God's grace. It might be that there's injustice. There is somebody who is living and they did something to you that was so terrible. And it was. And they hurt you in a way that you could... I mean, they ought to die for it and they should. And they're just going on like nothing ever happened, but it messed you up. <clears throat> Let me just tell you something. God knows. God knows about it. God hasn't forgotten the evil that was done to you. And He'll judge it. God can still use you. And God can use your life and He can use your testimony. And I think about a guy like Joseph. And I'll just tell you, as far as a king goes, as far as the man who is the father of the Messiah, there's not a, more, a man more qualified to be in the lineage of David than Joseph. And yet this whole genealogical line and Matthew chapter 1 simply proves that the guy who was Jesus' earthly father actually wasn't. The guy who was Jesus' earthly father actually wasn't. He's the guy that the angel came to in a dream and said, Joseph, move into Egypt. Now what man from Judah, I mean a guy like Joseph that fears God wants to live in Egypt. Hey, who, who wants to be, who wants that? What man wants to have to raise the Messiah but have him not be his son? Joseph. And I'll tell you something. When you look in the Scripture and you just look at a guy who was just used by God and did great things, it was a guy who was actually rejected for being in the lineage of Christ. But look what God did. And you look at guys like Joseph, I mean like, uh, sorry, Jonathan, Joe and John, if you're Kelly, she nicknames everybody. Uh, Joe and John, if you're one of those guys, and you look at their lives and you say, well, it must have been terrible. I want to tell you something. You never convinced Jonathan his life was terrible. Just think about it. when he was living. Man, that rascal David supplanted you. You better watch and talk about my friend David. 
I'm going to tell you something about David. There's not a man who has a heart more like God than my friend David. You better not say a word about him. That's Jonathan's attitude. <laughs> well, you know, he's trying to take your kingdom. Take my kingdom, nothing. It's his kingdom. God gave it to him. I'll be his servant. And I get to be his servant. You know what I mean? If, if he ought to resent anybody, it'd be me. The ex-king's son. If anybody ought to be threatened, but David's not threatened by me. David's my best friend. Try to talk about David to Jonathan. Saul said, he's trying to take your kingdom. And Jonathan, Jonathan just simply said, why are you trying to kill an innocent man? And his dad tried to kill him for David. You know, a lot of guys say, enough's enough. I'm not going to die for somebody else. I'm not going to give my life for somebody else. There's no greater model. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. And that's actually what Jonathan did. It's actually what Jonathan did. He put his life on the line for his friend David. He was a friend. And you know something? If I'm going to stand at the end of my life and I'm going to have God judge me and I have to ask whether I'd want to be Jonathan the king or Jonathan David's friend, you know who I'd want to be? I want to be Jonathan David's friend. And if I had to stand at the end of my life and I'd have to, I want to ask the question, Joseph, in the proper lineage of Christ, or Joseph the husband of Mary who was just a good man, you know who I'd want to be? I want to be Joseph the good man. This is what he is. Christian, one of the reasons we're so messed up, one of the reasons we make bad choice after bad choice after bad choice is because we reject what God says is good. And what God has done in your life and what God is doing in your life by His grace, my friend, is good. God can do amazing things with you. you got two choices. You can be a soul. You can say, well, God may have rejected me, but I'll kill whoever he makes king. That's what Saul did. Did Saul succeed in that? He spent the rest of his life acting like a jealous adolescent, chasing a man that couldn't be killed. Yeah. Acted like an idiot the rest of his life because he was a rebel. And his son? His son was the polar opposite of him. A good man. A godly man. We're talking about him today. And I'll just tell you something. If I could have a friend like Jonathan, that's, that's the friend I want to have, man. If I could be a friend like Jonathan, that's the friend I want to be. Good man. Godly man. What are you going to be? Are you going to be a person who gets bitter because you don't think life's fair and your circumstances aren't good? Or are you going to be the kind of person that says, you know what, God's good and I'm going to find out what He's going to do with me. I'm going to find out what He can do with a guy that's, yeah, I'm messed up. <laughs> you know? Some of us, we're born and we just think, you know what, I was just born messed up. I've heard testimonies of believers before and they tell me where they came from and what had happened. They say, I was just a mess. That's all I can say about it. I'm going to tell you something. God can use you. Amen. By His grace and His mercy. The first way God can use you, the first thing God wants to do with you, I should say, is He wants to save your soul. You know, you may think I'm messed up, but the truth of the matter is if somebody else were to tell a story, they'd talk about how you've messed up. You hear me? You may say, well, you know what? I've been messed up, but you know what? Other people would say how you've messed up. The Bible says all sin and comes short of the glory of God. And you're so busy focusing on other people's sins that you completely overlook yours. And you're exactly the same thing that you hate in everybody else. That's what you are to everyone else. You hate your parents, and guess what? Your kids will hate you because you're exactly like they are. I don't know how many young people I've met that have grown up and their parents have had addictions. They've been... Uh, they, they, they've been addicted to alcohol. They've been addicted to whatever. There's all kinds of addictions. And the kids hate it about their parents. They resent it about their parents. And they do the exact same thing. The very same thing. And all their lives, I remember Brother Rick Flanders asking somebody, somebody was angry and bitter about something. It was, I think it was a young man. He said, what are you so mad about? He said, well, I'm mad about my dad. What did your dad do? And he said, uh, he did this. And he said, well, what? why do you think your dad did that? Kid thought for a little bit. He said, well, you know what? I know my granddad. He did the same thing. And he said, why did your granddad do that? And he said, well, probably his granddad did. And he said, what about his granddad? And they just went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. He had generation after generation after generation that just reacted to what had happened to them. 
instead of responding to what Jesus had done. What did Jesus do? Well, the Bible says we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible says when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And my friend, your parents may have sinned against you, and you may be having consequences for it, but you've sinned yourself. And the first person to stop and say, you know something, I'm not going to just worry about what somebody else has done. I'm going to worry about what I've done. Okay. The Bible says that that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But then it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend, Jesus died for your sins. And there are people who literally will not accept forgiveness of sins because they're so focused on other sinners. And yet Jesus died for your sins. And you won't take what God's done for you. And you'll find if you will take all the things that have happened to you and you take all the things that you've done, and you'll just simply take it and call it what God does, and you'll call it wicked. And you'll call it sin. And you read what the Bible says, you'll find out that it has been nailed to Jesus' cross. And that it has been covered by His sinless, perfect blood. If ever a person in the world was treated unjustly, it's the one who never sinned who died for sin. Who had God's wrath that I deserved and that you deserved directed at Him in full judgment. If ever anything has been unfair, if ever anything has been unjust, it is that God's Son died for us and God did it. And you're so ticked off and you're so mad about what's happened to you, you just can't get over it and you can't even look at the fact that Jesus died for you and that you could be forgiven. And if you'll ever just take all of that and just say, you know what, God, I just want to be forgiven. I'm just not going to focus on what everybody's done to me. I'm going to focus on what I've done. And I'm going to look to the cross of Jesus Christ and I'm going to receive Him as my Savior. God will take all that and He'll sort you out. He'll just fix everything. I'm telling you, God can just fix everything. He can take your heart that's so hurting and so broken that it literally feels like you're going to blow up inside. You know the feeling, don't you? you just got so much going on. You're so mad. You're so angry. and You're just making you sick. And God can just take it all. And He can forgive you and He can give you peace. And just by saying, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior, God will forgive your sins. And He'll give you a home in heaven. And Jesus Christ will be your, your brother. And God will be your heavenly Father. And you'll be adopted into God's perfect family. And it won't matter anymore where you came from because you will literally be, literally be heirs together with Jesus Christ, God's Son, God's child. You won't be focused anymore on whose kid you were and how messed up it is. You'll just realize I'm God's son, I'm God's child. And that will supersede everything else. I'm telling you something. If you get up here and you say, I'm God's son, you don't want to be down here and be Saul's son. I'm God's son. Well, who cares what Jeconiah did? Jesus is my Savior. God's my Father. And God's bigger than all of that. And you have a big God. He's bigger than your circumstances. And he's able to give you peace and help you find forgiveness. And I'm just telling you something. God will use you if you do that. How have you responded to your life circumstances? Are you better? Are you angry? Are you rebellious? Are you mad at God? Are you mad at everybody? Do you want to kill yourself? Do you want to kill other people? That's what happens when you let bitterness happen. I mean, literally, you get so mad that you either just want to die or you just want to kill someone. God will fix it all. He'll give you the peace of God. He'll give you the love of God. And He'll use your life. And you'll look at the end and you'll say, I can't believe what God's done. Because that's the kind of God He is. You're just wrong about Him. God, I pray that You would help us to know You as You are. And I pray that You would help us to find everything through the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, please bless and move in our invitation and our service this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Before I finish the prayer, as everyone has their heads bowed and eyes closed, I would ask that you would uh, just bow your head. You can sit up in your seat. You don't need to cover your eyes or anything like that. But I'd like to have a private time. And you wouldn't like it if you were sharing something personal and somebody looked in on you. And you wouldn't like it if you were embarrassed. And I promise that I wouldn't do anything to call you out or point you out or embarrass you. But if you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, you don't even know me. You don't even know what's going on in my life. But God does. And... My circumstances, boy, I have a lot in common. I have a lot in common with people that have had some really terrible things in their life. And I don't want you to embarrass me. I don't want you to call me out. But this morning, God showed me something. That how I respond to who God is. You know, God's good, and I haven't seen it. I thought God wasn't good. But you know what? From the Word of God, I'm seeing people that responded right. From Joseph and from, from the example of Jonathan, I've seen that if I respond right, man, God can still use my life. 
And I'm not even saved. I'm here this morning, and I, I've just I've been angry at God. I've been angry at everybody. I can't live like this. I want God. I want God's help. I want to be born again this morning. If I could know how, would you just pray for me? Don't call me out, embarrass me. But if I could know how, I'd want to know that I have eternal eternal life and I have a home in heaven. Just slip your hand up if that's you this morning. Just slip it right up. Slip it right back down. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. Okay? Just slip them right back down. I see those hands. Just a minute, I'll address that. The second thing that I'd like to mention this morning. You know, many believers still don't, don't have everything resolved in their lives. There are a lot of believers who, because of their life circumstances, they're angry, they're bitter against God. They don't understand how God could allow or what God uh, could be doing. And so because of it, you believe lies. This morning from God's Word, we've seen that who God is and what God makes us is better than what we could have been if everything had been right. And you've realized this morning, I need to find my worth in the cross of Jesus Christ and what God wants to do with my life. And I'm excited about what God's going to do, how He's going to change, take what was evil, and He's going to work it for good in my life. If that's you and you're here this morning, God's spoken, you would just slip your hand up. Pastor, pray for me. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But I've had things in my life. Just slip it up. Slip it right back down. I see that. I wouldn't call you out. Just slip it back down. That's what the invitation time is. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless and to move in it. Just very quickly, if you've this morning recognized that you don't know Jesus as your Savior, now you only have to be born again one time. But the gospel is simply this, and this is the thing that will make everything right. We're sinners. We've sinned against God. And Jesus Christ died for sin. And God made the gospel. He made salvation, being saved from our sin. Very, very simple. The Bible puts it this way, and this is the whole thing. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're here this morning. You could simply just tell God what's in your heart. You could say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Is that true? Tell God that in your heart. God, I know I'm a sinner, and God, I know that my sin has separated from me from you, and I've been bitter and angry against you because of it. But God, but I recognize that Jesus died for my sin, and what I need actually more than anything else is not to look at what's happened to me. I need to look at what you've done for me. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I want, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want you to be my Father. I'm asking you to save me. If you just prayed that and just said that in your heart to God, you just slip your hand up. Just slip up your hand and say, you know, I just prayed and I asked Jesus to be my Savior. If that's you, just slip your hand up. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. I'll just slip it right back down. Anyone else? It's just as simple as asking. God, I just ask that those that have received Jesus as their Savior, Lord, that they would be able to receive the promises that you've, that you've made to them, that you've given them. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor, you know what God's dealt with me about bitterness in my heart, about anger against God, about God's plan and what I think my life should be versus what it actually is. And I've realized that there's nothing wrong with what God is doing. Man's done evil and I've done evil and I need to own up to what I've done and I just want to I want to find my worth in Jesus Christ. I want to see what God can do with my life. If that's you, and, and would, you, would you just pray this, God? God, I just want to ask forgiveness for my sin. And God, I just want to accept that my life is the evil that's happened to me in my life. You didn't do. You're not guilty for it. So God, I don't need to forgive you. You need to forgive me for falsely accusing you of being evil. Will you forgive me, God? Will you give me forgiveness? God, I want you to work in my life. Help me with my bitterness and give me your peace. If you've prayed that, my friend, God will do it. We're going to have just a moment, just a little bit of time, when you can do business with God as individuals. So we're going to call it the invitation. So we're going to ask God's blessing. And God, would you please bless and move in the invitation while we pray in Jesus' name. If you'll please stand at your feet, your feet and open your blue hymn books to page 394. Brother Todd is standing in the back of the room, and none of us here would ever embarrass you, and none of us here uh, would ever point anyone out. But if you've prayed to, and asked the Lord Jesus to be your Savior today, you've trusted uh, Christ as your Savior, 
Brother Taj wouldn't need a counselor to tell you, tell you anything, but he could just fill out a decision card. Just You could just go and tell somebody, hey, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. And uh, I, want, I want somebody to know it. I want to tell someone about it. And we'd invite you to do that in the invitation. If you're too, you, you'd be, uh, feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable doing that, tell me after the service, right at the end of the service. You're here this morning, though, and you've made a decision. God's spoken to you about bitterness in your heart or something that... Uh, that, that is because you've had the wrong perspective of what God is doing? Would you just do business with God? If you need to tell someone, Brother Tosh is in the back, and you could just say, hey, you know something, I want you to know, God's, God's done something in my life, and I've given my bitterness over to God. If that's you, do business with the Lord in the invitation time. That's what the invitation is all about. If you open to page 394 while we sing, if you need to just do business with God, you just need to pray. You feel comfortable and feel free just to bow your head where you're standing at and do business with God instead of instead of singing. If you need to bow and, and to kneel at your seat, feel, feel free to do that as well. Uh, we want God to have His way in the invitation. I surrender all. And if that's true of you, if that's your life, let's sing it. If not, do business with God in the invitation. I surrender all.